Okay, thanks for being here, guys. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Um, so, pilot season. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> um, so we're here today to talk about, you know, I'm sure most of you have heard the term pilot season, or some of you may know a more detailed synopsis of what it's all about. Some of you may not. We're here to give you the grub. Um, quickly, pilot season generally happens between January and March, sometimes the beginning of April if they're running behind. It's where everyone scrambles. The new shows have been picked up for pilots by the networks and studios, and everyone is vying for the same jobs. Um, and you go on like three auditions a day. Sometimes you get your sides at your audition material at midnight the night before and you've got to rearrange your schedule for the next day and there's acting coaches and wardrobes and you basically live out of your car and don't see anyone and have nervous breakdowns and all those wonderful things while still being professional in the room and um and then may is up front where the pilots get picked up or do not get picked up and then in the fall is when you guys see those pilots go on air and they become the new series that you guys get hooked to and uh, adore and either keep on the air or do not. Um, so, and that's, that's the basic synopsis and, and we'll get to, if we have time, even how that landscape is changing a little bit now with things like Netflix and Amazon um, and, um, and, and cable even, how some of the shows are all, pilot season kind of is starting to become an all, all year uh, round thing. Um, which is cool for us because it's kind of like, yes, we still have the rush of January to March, but the pressure, I feel like, is a, is a little less because we know there's opportunity. And you've got a story, so go well, ahead. Yeah, I'm laughing because you said you live out of your car, and I can't tell you how many times I've been in some public restroom, like, shaving my face because <laughs> I've got another one, and this guy's clean cut. You know what I mean? So I'm shaving a mustache off. And there's some other actor that comes walking in the room and he's putting on a different pair of slacks because he's got a place that he's going to down the street, you know. So you really are living out of your car. So it is nice that they've spread it out a little bit more because you would have these times when it was a true pilot season, like you were saying, you know, uh, late December or, or usually January to yeah. March, where it's literally I've got one right after the other after the other. I had to pay and the him. only time you see people is at the auditions. Like yeah. that's how you catch up with your friends. Like, Great to see you. Got to run to the next one. You I know? had to pay an ex-girlfriend one time two hundred dollars to stay with me for two days and just go over lines with me. And she's like, "I'm like, I got a bedroom. It's all good. Just please, I need." He the house. just had yeah. to pay that ex-girlfriend, <laughs> and she wasn't a hooker, right? Just kidding. To uh, read lines with me? No. I, I also think that like the the pilot season, or at least I, the landscape is changing. But how it usually was sort of like January to March is this like crazy crunch time and it's also sort of like the holy grail for actors and we we put kind of an an unrealistic hope on it there's this like insane hope like oh my gosh well okay I, I, I'm, I haven't been working I haven't been working but pilot season is coming up pilot season is coming up and then and then you you go and sometimes you test like seven times and don't get a single thing and you're like sitting there signing paperwork where you're looking at the numbers that you will be making for the next seven years, but then you don't get the job over and over and over again, which is like completely crazy. But, but, but it's also, you know, putting all of this hope in this one like eight week chunk of time can be incredibly defeating. You walk in with this like great sense of hope, but then there's also this like really hard crash down. And, and when it the does, it obligation to keep it fresh time and time yes. again. Oh my gosh, um, yes. Like it's the first time all over again. Right. So let's jump into um, the shows you guys are on now or working or have been working on. How did you get that job? Was it a pilot season story? Or, or talk about that because everyone's journey is so different. I've, I've got a recurring role right now on a show called Longmire and this is kind of a pilot season story. In some respects, I, I auditioned uh, for one of the main characters on uh, on um, on Longmire, went in there, tested for it. They told my manager, "We love him, we love him, we love him." And then they went a different route. And about a year later, I was off doing a, a film, and they I got a phone call from the producers of Longmire, and they said, "We'd love to bring you on for a, as a guest star." Uh, I happened to be working on something else, so I couldn't do it at that time. And then they wound up calling again, which, thank God, you know, I mean, it's just a wonderful 
thing that kind of happened there because I was not expecting anything from this. And so it's like two years later, and now I've got a recurring role on the show. I would have much rather had that series regular job, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's nice to see that things do come back around, you know? Um, and you didn't have to go through the, the, the pilot no, testing this was hell. No, this was just an offer. So that, and those are rare, you know. Uh, at least for me, they're rare. I don't know about everyone else, but yeah. Uh, so it's, it's nice when that happens. Uh, but it, it's also kind of, like we were saying, you go in for all these different people. You're going in there. You're trying to do the best that you possibly can. Uh, but it's nice to know that things do come back around. That this person, you know, that you auditioned for two years ago remembers you. They're waiting for the right time to put, to put you in something. So kind of a nice reminder of like always do your best. Yeah, always do your best. And I think as an actor, you just got to stay positive uh, because this thing that you may be going in for today may not be right for you 100 uh, percent. And they will get the right person. You know, they, they almost always do. Uh, and this thing that's that you a may very positive way of looking at it. <laughs> I have to be positive. Otherwise, I appreciate I that. Yeah. I appreciate um, that. <laughs> But yeah, I've, I've spent enough time with my actor friends going, ah, I'm an actor. It's a tough racket. No, I like that. I like that. What about you? Um, well, Friday Night Lights, I didn't come in until episode five, so that was easy. Bunheads was, I, I first auditioned to play a showgirl at the beginning, so it was like a room full of these five foot ten, five foot eleven amazing girls, and we had to do like a real dance call. It was wow. Is intense. But you have former training. In yeah, but I hadn't danced in five years, so okay. I tried really hard to get through it. And then Amy Sherman Palladino pulled me out of the line, and she goes, will you read this other part really fast? I was like, oh, thank God, yes. Does it mean I don't have to dance? Because that girl was only in, like, two episodes. And then they gave me the, the, to read for the part of Truly, who was written as a very, very petite, mousy girl. I'm not a petite girl. I'm like, from 5'10". Definitely ten. not mousy. 5'10", <laughs> I got... Shoulders like a football player. And I was like, okay. And then I read it, and it just fit. And so it pulled me out of that room. I was still in my sweaty dance audition clothes in my, in my test, actually. That's and then amazing. That's how that happened. I love Amy. I worked with her on Gilmore Girls. I know. She's I fantastic. Her. Eccentric and fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and what about you? Um, it's funny because the two shows that I have been a series regular on, Everwood and Grey's Anatomy, both of the, I didn't test for either of them. The first for Everwood... I walked in auditioning for a pilot for like a 24 year old and at the time I was I was uh, 22 but I looked 14 yeah. and and I, I remember finishing that audition and the casting director was like that's great I think you could pass for 15 we're looking <laughs> for this character on this other show so it was like I literally went outside and had 15 minutes to learn Hannah Hannah material and then I walked in and went on tape in New York and two days later I was signing a, a you know two-year deal it was nuts mm, <laughs> it was insane I didn't experience any and apparently I guess they had been like looking for this character for a long time and it just it just kind of all fell into place and clicked all at once for Grays I had um, I, I had done a pilot for Shonda Rhimes the year before, and she wrote this role for me as a two-episode guest star. She just offered me, like, oh, we're just going to have this character come on and then get fired, but I love you, and so I just, you know, have a role. You know, so I, so I went. It's just I that went, easy, folks. No, I know. Well, 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 yeah, I just have, but you it was. Some but it was just, a role. <laughs> It was a, but it was a two-episode gig. It wasn't like a yeah, series with Shonda regular. Rhimes on Grey's well, right. Anatomy. Yeah. I've worked on like three of Shonda's shows. She has never once done that for me. <laughs> She's sorry. Stay positive. Stay positive. Stay positive. positive. You, can you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> but it was but it was amazing because I went on. I went on with like three with Jesse Williams, Norza Hetner, and Robert Baker, and. Um, and I went on knowing I was going to be fired. And the three of them mm -hmm. went on thinking that they were going to ha have to like audition all season to stick around. And I'm like, I said my goodbyes. I went off. I did Mad Men. I did Glee. I did like some other random all those stuff. Other small shows. And then <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, 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 you're making me. I'm not trying to. Does anyone watch Mad Men? That would be awesome. I just am. Is that Mad Men show still on? Is that <laughs> I think it got canceled like in the first season. <laughs> Who would know? <laughs> but, but then, but then the, 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 the morning after my firing episode aired, I got a call from my agent saying they're think, they want to bring you back and they're talking about a potential series regular gig. And I was like, what? Oh, and also we're going to kill all of your other friends on the show. Yes, that's all. Spoiler alert, guys. <laughs> 
painful and awkward in so many ways. Uh, but, but yeah, but then I just went back and then it was sort of like a crazy audition process for that entire season six. It was like every episode, I'm like, do they write anything for me? Am I gonna be able to show anything? Are they gonna keep me around? And then I didn't find out until the following June that I was actually going to stick around. So it was, um, so it was a very year was long like a test. test. It was yeah. like a year long test, every That's single amazing. episode. Yeah. Also, I feel like we're throwing out Words that you might not understand, like test and all that stuff. Yeah, we're getting there. Are right, you? I'm gonna do your do you job. Wanna I'm gonna Go do. Sit here. Just sit here. Okay. <laughs> Wait, we gotta switch. <laughs> so, Stacy, do you want to talk about testing? Oh God. There's a process. In Once pilot you audition, season. so we've heard about the auditioning, and so that can go from like a pre-read to pr a which, which going means no producers in the no room. producers, no cameras, to going on camera, to going in for producers, to then if they like you, you go to test, and testing or is go when back you for producers like six times, then test. There is that, and this is the different. same sides, the same part. It can take a long time, but testing is actually going in for the studio and for the network who have the ultimate say, and when you go in. You sign your contract before you audition, and like, also like for the, seven years or whatever. And you're this, looking at money. I mean, you're just staring money. at money, at numbers. You're like, <laughs> this well, could change money. my it's life. It's amount, but yes. yes. Oh. They're like, here's the dollar bills, y'all. <laughs> Sign your life away, but we might not want you. I'm but also, the, I'm thinking about the guest house I can put my ex-girlfriend in for future jobs. I don't even have to pay her anymore. <laughs> Um, but also the studio and the network often, sometimes it's the same, but often enough it's too different. Like you'll be reading for Sony Studios, but uh, you know, Fox Network or, or whatever. So, so when we are talking about testing, you're first having to read for the studio, which is like, you know, 30 people who never laugh or smile. Uh, and then, and then if you clear that, sometimes you get, Sorry, I'm jumping on you. I'll let her finish, but but then you jump to network. So it's actually two different audiences completely. And we know how many opinions are in each room, and it's a very interesting thing. So go ahead. Oh, that was, I'm done. <laughs> right? I don't, that's it. <laughs> it's also really interesting. I, well, I was just going to say that, like, some one of my absolute best friends in the world, I met testing against her like four times in the, over the course of 10 days, like for the same role. And the two of us just like fell in love with each other even though we were competing against one another. And finally like the third time we saw each other, we're like, what is your phone number? We are meant to be friends. And, and we've been friends for like eight years. I mean, it's like sometimes you, you form these like incredible relationships because you sort of realize that you see the same people at every audition and you kind of become this like weird, like sisterhood or brotherhood where it's like, oh, it's you again. Oh, maybe you'll get it this time. Maybe I'll get it this time. But you know, there are enough roles to eventually go around. So the important question is who got the role? Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. Like, I think I did. No, it, no, I think it was, I think it was like, it was back and forth. I mean, there were, or neither of us did. It okay, was, all right. yeah. <laughs> So the testing process, yeah, you can go in front of studio. Uh, sometimes you're against, I've had it where I've been against nine girls. I've been against myself, because they'll test you on tape it, with the producers, and then you, uh, some, it, it, it varies. And then, you know, they can hold you for 10 days, or they can let you know that afternoon, or sometimes they'll excuse you in front of other people, and they keep the other people around, and you're getting excused. And I mean, it, it's, it's like brutal. And then from there, if you clear studio, then you move on to network. Sometimes network is the same day. Sometimes network is three days later. Sometimes you just go on. Often what they're doing now is you go into a room, and you self-tape, and they just show everyone's tape. Uh, East Coast and West Coast to the producers, both studio and network. So the problem with that is it's great for the actor because you have more freedom, but um, but they can hold you longer. Sometimes they can hold you for 15 days because it takes that long to get the tape around. Meanwhile, you're auditioning for other parts. They want to test you. This other person has you on first right of refusal, which means they basically own you, you've already signed the money, and so you can or cannot test for something else because maybe they don't want you in second position because they want to know they can get you right away and you like that role more, but this audition was the week before. And so there's all the, it's a constant like chessboard that's moving and the whole time you're just trying to like not go insane and just go, God, please give me the role I was meant to because like I don't know, I don't know which thing to, you know, you don't really have a choice, I mean, you know? other than if you just say no to a test and like right. um so that's kind of the testing part of it all then we move on to getting the job or not getting the job and that's a different story but let's pretend we get the job 
uh, for the sake of today. Um, and then, then there's the table read, the wardrobe fittings, the. So what I'm what I'm getting at is that you're never really safe. It's like it's not just. <laughs> The audition doesn't just consist of like reading lines. The aud- you're basically auditioning, like you said, the first full year you were even on the show, you were auditioning, which I think is such an excellent point. And I think something really valuable to bring up as far as respect, like it is so hard to get a job that no matter if it's your first season, your third season, your first day on the show, to really treat it like it's a constant audition is really valuable in this day and age because things are moving so quickly. Um, and so there's the table read when the wardrobe fitting. So you guys talk about that a little bit and kind of the concept and the nerves behind it all. And you can get fired at a table read yeah. and all of that. I, I did a, a guest star for a pilot, a, a pilot that never got picked up. But the woman who was cast as the lead in it had a horrible case of laryngitis on the day of the table read and was fired because it just because after when going after going test. through the whole thing she was there but she was talking like this and it was a it was a sitcom so it was like the jokes weren't landing because she didn't have a full voice and even though they had all chosen her after the table read they're like it's we can't yeah we can't you know bank on her anymore because i mean even though like she was healed like 3 days later and had a full voice it's just, it's in that moment, like the execs, the studio folks, people get really, really nervous. They're like, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? I don't know. Ah! So, so there is, it, because by it's the terrifying. way, the studio and network people are like buying for their jobs as well. So it's like everyone's got Everyone a wants say to look in good. Yeah. They, want to, they want everyone to see that they've chosen the right people as well as they want all the chemistry to work well together. And sometimes you, you get to a table read and the chemistry between the actors. It just falls flat. And so then somebody gets recast because of that. Yeah. And sometimes you shoot the whole pilot, and then they test the pilot around and show it to lots of people, and then the people like rate the different actors, and some test high and some test we're low. we're just cattle. It's great. We're commodity. I mean, we're a commodity. And so people that end up testing low then get fired and recast, and they reshoot those scenes for that character so that by the time it goes, if it gets picked up and goes to series, it's a completely different person. I had a friend who that happened to, and he was so, it was like his first show and it got picked up and he was like, whoa, no, I'm not gonna be on it. You know, it was, it was devastating. Yeah. There's kind of an unspoken rule in Hollywood that you haven't really made it until you've been fired from a show. Like, <laughs> Kind of thing. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I was like, have you been fired? No, we had to reshoot Bunheads, though, because we got a different lead girl. And it sucked because we had Ben Vereen the first time we shot, and then we couldn't get him back the second time, and it was really sad. Aww. Do you have any table read stories? Or I've got one. There was a gentleman I worked with uh, one time who was dyslexic. Um, and thank God the producers were wise enough to realize, look, this guy's a stud, and he's awesome, and he's going to be great in this part. But he's dyslexic. And so a table read for him is a nightmare. You know, and I didn't know he was dyslexic at the time, so I'm sitting there going, this guy can't even read. You know? <laughs> uh, meanwhile, literally the next day, he was completely and totally off book for the whole entire episode. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But it's one of those things where you're, hopefully you've got a producer or producers in the room that are wise enough to see that this guy's going to be able to, to bring it to the table when it, when it needs to be done. Um, but table reads, can, people's process is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. I've always been the guy that, like, on the table read, I want to be at my best. Uh, and there are some people that it takes them a little time to find the part or to, to work their way into it working with other people. Um, we've all had that where you work with an actor and you know the first take that you have is terrible and the second one is brilliant. You know. I've never um. had that. <laughs> Ariel's brilliant all the time. <laughs> one take Johnny right here. <laughs> True story, the finale of Vampire Diaries. I'm going to use my mic. <laughs> Actually was one take. <laughs> When I did the go-go Lexi elbow punch. There you go. It was one take, and it was kind of a moment I had. But hey, it took me 10 years, so. Um, Okay, so we've talked about the table reads. Now we're on to, have you guys ever gotten, or is it just me? Like, uh, some shows will do camera tests before you, if you have the luxury of doing a camera test before you actually start shooting, which is they'll be doing it for a number of reasons. Testing what your hair and makeup looks like, your wardrobe, actors next to each other, lighting, height, you know, all that stuff. Um, so 
Have you gotten any bizarre notes? Like you've done a camera test, thought it went well, and then like the next day they're like, no, you gotta shave your head. I've never, I've never done that. Like Pete Berg, when we did Friday Night Lights, literally, I bumped into him at a restaurant about a week and a half before we shot, and I'd just gotten the job, I'm down in Austin, and he goes, hey man, forgot to tell you, grow out your facial hair. And I'm like, okay, duly noted. Uh, take camera test, completely and totally out of it. My first day on set, I walk in, I've got one scene in the pilot, basically. You know what I mean? It's a scene with Taylor and I. And he goes, hey, uh, we're gonna shoot that one scene with you and Taylor in a second, but I wanted to improv a scene first. Do you guys know Taylor Kitsch? <laughs> no, nobody sure. knows Wait, who he, he is. I know. Wait, I'm, is he on that I, show, Mad I've never heard of him, but I just wanna make sure we all knew who he was talking about, okay. Whatever. <laughs> Look, he's not here on the actors panel, so yeah, just saying. I spent my whole life getting this. Oh my God, are you on Friday Night Lights? And I said, yeah. Then you know Taylor. And I'm like, <laughs> Can you introduce me? Can you introduce yeah. me to Kyle Chandler and Taylor Kitsch? <laughs> nope. Anyway, nope, so I will not. to shoot this scene, and Berg says, um, so yeah, uh, we're just gonna have you like come in, you're gonna wake him up. Um, can we get him some underwear real quick? And they brought these tidy whities out, and I'm like, I don't wanna be in my tidy whities in front of me. I don't know any of these people. <laughs> And now I have this scene memorized, and I could I could literally feel the sweat coming down because I'm improving a scene now. Like no one told me I'm going to be improving a scene on my first day on this show, uh, so I was literally sweating bullets. But see, that's the that's the other side. You're talking about something where yeah. you you had no rehearsal time, no communication. You were expected to show up and do a job, and you were like thrown into it. Yeah. And then did they, did you know you were recurring going into it or did they hire you after they saw you in Whitey Tidies? No, so what happened, well, when I actually... Well, that, I mean, <laughs> I would rehire him. They saw me in my tidy ways and there was just a contract thrown at me. Uh, no. Money! Uh, what happened, actually, when I went in for Friday Night Lights, um, they, were, they weren't sure if they wanted the character to be a, a, a father or a brother. So I'm sitting there in the waiting room and it's me and, you know, 15 other guys, but there's father, there's, you know, guys in their 50s and, and guys in their, you know, early 20s like myself. No, I'm <laughs> late 20s at that point. But, you know, guys in their late 20s or, you know, early 20s uh, and guys literally in their 50s. So he had, he didn't know what he wanted to do with this character, I think, at that point. Uh, but then there's also that process, it's like you shoot the pilot yeah. So we've already talked about you can get fired at the table read, you can get fired after they've tested the pilot. So now you've got this fear up until May, where basically May is when they say... May is the, the upfront. So everyone goes in, uh, you, they announce what shows it got picked up. If you get picked up, you go to upfronts in New York. It's a big show and dance. And then you have a few months off and you go into production in, around July. But there's still, Or you don't get picked up. Yeah, or you don't get picked up. And sometimes, I mean, you may not know until like May 14th that your show isn't going to go. Uh, and up, and up, the buzz up until then could be like, it's going to be the greatest show on television, the network loves it, and then May 14th, you don't get a phone call to go to New York to do upfronts, and then you don't have a job. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to open it up to uh, the audience, because I know we're a little bit short on time, but quickly, to wrap up kind of the process, once it's picked up, you shoot the pilot, like you guys, I think, are kind of starting to hear, you, you can get fired even after you've shot the pilot, it's picked up and literally breakdowns go out. Like, you, I'll get a call, my friend will get fired on a pilot, and mm -hmm. I'll get the call to go audition for the role. Like, that's how, you know, the, the, the game just keeps changing. Um, so, so then you've got the cast, and you start shooting, mm -hmm. and then it's air date. Mm -hmm. And if you're not on, like, a Netflix or an Amazon or a series that's already ordered now, it's so brutal. Nowadays, they'll give a show like three episodes before they either decide to keep going or cancel it based yeah. on ratings. And Lone Star that. got two. Huh? Lone Star got two. Yeah, and Lone then Star they had two episodes. So uh, if you're an audience member and you like a show, watch it. Tell your friends. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to kind of come full circle. That's how, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's just an ever-changing game. And, and then you can also get fired by getting killed off the show yeah that's also another way to die yeah um that was the worst joke anyone ever played on me <laughs> it was like the third season of friday or third episode of friday night lights and uh brad leland goes hey derek i want you to meet my buddy over here and he introduced me to this guy and, and the guy goes oh you're the guy who plays billy riggins and i said yeah and he goes dude man he goes i'm so sorry about that that the, the, the fourth episode and i go oh well, no I'm like, what, what are you I'll wear my underwear. I'll wear my underwear. <laughs> he goes, oh my God, man, he, he, you haven't read it. And I said, no. He goes, well, 
goes, I'm sorry, man. I mean, it's a cool way to go out, though. I mean, you're a sinner, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm literally almost in tears, and Brad goes, we're just fucking with you, man. Oh, that's horrible, horrible. All right, who's got questions? Sweet, gotta go. <laughs> yeah. Um, seeing as how you guys have done so much improv on Friday Night Lights, has it changed how you do your audition? Are you more comfortable now because you're ready to fly by the seat of your pants? I, I think it depends on the show that you're going in for. I mean, obviously, if you're going in for like an Aaron Sorkin show, you don't want to improv that because mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a rhythm to the way that Aaron Sorkin writes. Uh, I do think, and you know, this is something that's up to debate uh, with other actors, I think. But when I go in, I try to, as best I can, put it in my own words. Now, I'm not going to completely and totally bastardize some writer's script uh, because you have to be aware that these people have put a lot of time into this script. Uh, so for you to go in there and willy-nilly change words left and right uh, can wind up biting you in the ass. Mm. So you have to be a little careful with doing that, but at the same time, I try <laughs> to make it as natural. And, you know, if there's a, I have not seen you since Friday, I might change that to a, look, I haven't seen you since Friday. Mm -hmm. You know, just to make it roll a little more trippingly off the tongue. Well, Shakespeare. Say it to me again. <laughs> trippingly off the tongue. Oh, I was going to say, I haven't seen you since Friday, but okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> who, who has a question? Go ahead. Are there places besides LA that they're um, casting for a lot of pilots? And so where, where should you go? New York. New York, New York. yeah. Is that better than? No, LA. For you definitely want to be in LA. Yeah, because because even if you're in if you're in New York, if you have to test, you have to fly out to LA to test for network and studio. They're not testing in New York, <sighs> or maybe they are sometimes. Very rare. I was going to say I have a different point of view, but you probably shouldn't follow my point of view. Listen to them. <laughs> If you're in New York, I say test on tape and send it to them. If they want you, they'll find you. I did this pilot season in New York. It was kind of nice. Well, I, see, I lived in New York during pilot season for the first six years that I was in the business, and I felt like every tape that I ever sent to California is probably somewhere in Iowa right yeah. now. Like, Buried it, somewhere. It just, now, I mean, obviously, there are people that get cast from New York constantly. So, you know, maybe it's that my auditions were crap. I, I also feel like the game's changed a little bit. Like, it used to be you had to be in the room, but when networks and studios actually started testing tapes, uh, like it was their choice to do it that way. I think that the freedom opened up a little bit and now with like Amazon and Netflix, people are just doing things a little differently now. And like for example, um, I'm on a new show, The After, and I tested on tape. Uh, I, I went in for Chris once and they knew I was gonna be out of town and whatever and I Skyped in from Europe. And so I, I feel like, and that that's after years of running around, doing the pilot thing, testing nine times in one season, not getting it, you know. And so it was a huge like eye opener for me, uh, really to go, wow, like w w the work is the work is the work. And when it's right, it's right. And they'll find you and it'll happen. I think too you know? with the onslaught of, of the digital, you know, it's so easy nowadays to get tape to a producer. You know, it used to be back in the day, you, you literally had to send a physical copy of a tape from California or from New York yeah. to California. Now it's literally a matter of uploading it and the producers can see it you know, wherever they and are. And they can send it around to everybody. Yeah. I think the one advantage to being in the room is if they have adjustments, which I've done multiple times at tests, yeah. where, where they come back out and they ask you, they give you an adjustment and then you go back in and do it again. Like, you just don't have that kind of freedom, unless you're on a Skype session, unless you're like working face to face with right. the person. But if it's just a tape, it's, that's the only thing they have to go off of. You can't show them, you know, an yeah, adjustment. that's a good point. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, when you actually get to shooting your pilot season or in that phase, do you ever are you ever afraid to give your two cents on a character? Like, I think she was saying this really didn't really say this. Or great do you question. ever get to a point where you're like, I don't like this character anymore, I want out of the show? Ooh, <laughs> those are two different questions. I think you really have one. to feel that out, the first couple of episodes, to figure out if you're directors and producers are going to be open to that. And on Friday Night Lights, they definitely were in Amy's always open to that kind of stuff, but some shows, you just do what you're told to do. <laughs> you gotta feel it out. Yeah, you definitely have to feel it out. Our, our, on Grey's, our writers are amazing, and they have basically like opened the doors to us, so whenever they write something, if anybody has any kind of 
ideas or notes or they just say come to us come to us right away the one thing they don't like is you showing up on set and being like I don't want to say this or this I want to say it differently it's like you you do that right after the table read that's when that happens you know um in terms of I, I, there have been people on on our sh on on my show that wanted to leave and then they they asked to, to be out. Some did it in horrible ways and some did it in really lovely, loving ways. You know, like that, that does, that definitely does happen. I, I can't imagine wanting to give up a series regular gig. I cannot, I, agree. I cannot fathom it. But, but some people get bored or they just want to go do, like want to start a film career or they or they just have a bad attitude sometimes. <laughs> So, so it just kind of depends. Correct. Correct. I did two episodes of Grey's Anatomy, and I was in the makeup chair for four hours, and there was one actor slash actress in particular who was like, I just won off this damn show, and I'm like, You're I'm like, sitting there going, <laughs> As I'm getting prosthetics put on my nose, and I'm like, you're making like 150000 an episode right now. Oh, two years ago, I no know. one knew it's who, okay. the, knew who you the hell you up. were. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you're sitting here bitching to your makeup artist because of the fact that you can't go off and do movies right now. It literally blew my mind because I was just so thankful to even have this opportunity. You know, I'd been in the business at this point for 10 years. I had just gotten Friday Night Lights, which was my first big thing. And then immediately after getting Friday Night Lights, I got two episodes on Grey's Anatomy. I mean, you know, I was happier than a pig and shit. And then to sit there... <laughs> Yeah. There's like a profound disconnect, like a disconnect with reality. I don't, there's something that happens that is just like, who, what planet are you living on that you're not like overwhelmed with gratitude and, and not like on your knees thanking God every single day you're waking up yeah. that you have this I job. wish there was more of all of yous in Hollywood. <laughs> I really do. But you know um, okay, we've got a question, right? Oh, no, we have five minutes. That was the question. We have five <laughs> minutes. Make it count, people. Well, first off, your answer kind of led us to who that might be. <laughs> I'm not naming names. I wasn't even there during that time. <laughs> it's so <Sarah> true. <laughs> I don't even know anything. <laughs> I hope it's better. As, as working actors, are always looking for things. Uh, how do you go about, like, say, attending a television festival? Do you carry business cards on you? How do you meet other creatives? <laughs> business cards? <laughs> What's that? My I'm dad bought me some when I graduated college. I, I don't, it's a weird thing. Actors don't really carry business cards. I've met some that do. You just, yeah. type, you just type our names into IMDb and I know, you kind of like, figure it out. IMDb. A, a friend of mine bought me a shirt. I've never worn it, but it just says IMDb me. <laughs> Honestly, I'm glad you've you. never, never worn that shirt. That, <laughs> that's the worst thing I've ever heard. I'd rather see you in whitey tighties, which is like not great either. Well, but anyway, it's what I wear around the house. My whitey tighties and my IMDb me shirt. Do you have any I did friends? Did not want that picture. No. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think. Look, I think the special thing, especially about a festival like this, is it's all heart. And, and I think that the thing that at least keeps people coming to it or coming back is the the pure connection. And, and I think that's really important. It's it's about conversation. It's about passion for the work that we do, appreciating other people's work that's yeah. here. You know, it's, it's almost like a hub. Like, we see these other shows and they see ours, but we're never in the same place at the same time. So it's like this weekend where we all get to go, hey, you're awesome. Congratulations. I'm proud to be here. You know, and I think... I think that is the that is the business card. You know, it's the the pure exchange um, of honoring uh, of information and work. And beyond that, yeah, in this day and age with the internet, it's really easy. Or you give someone email, or you you know you share contacts on an iPhone. It's not. I mean, I wish it was kind of more businessy and back in the day informal, but it doesn't. If you're a producer or you have a production company, I think that's more you know, a normal exchange, but not really for us. And one thing that's really so cool about like an event like this, for every one person, like the person I was talking about on Grey's Anatomy, there's literally 120 a that are not like that at all. Uh, most of the people that you meet in this And business they're not invited here. <laughs> and you can tweet that, I'm on the board. <laughs> I think they wouldn't come to this. Yeah. I think people no, have wouldn't. this idea that Hollywood's like this shady backwoods, and there's aspects of that for sure. But literally 99.9% .9 of the people you come across in this business, whether they be actors, writers, creators of any kind, they're like the most wonderful people. I've, I've 
been so blessed to work with so many awesome people and then to have an opportunity to come to something like this where you get to celebrate other people's work while they're celebrating yours you know it's literally Great just been a love fest yeah it's been a huge love fest now maybe with- somebody will give me a job <laughs> all right anyone else we've got to wrap it up okay go ahead uh, so you mentioned a couple of ways the pilot season has changed like time has lasted longer and you can go on tape more easily is there anything else that's been changing Fox this year stopped doing pilot season because they're super smart. Really, I'm gonna Cliff's notes this. Do you guys? Mm-hmm. Yeah, really. They um. Well, theirs is now all year round. Pilot season. I don't know if you guys know the pilot season started in the 50s as a way for they wanted new shows to air exactly when the new car commercials would come out. It doesn't work that way anymore, but pilot season never stopped being what it is, and it doesn't need to exist. And finally, Kevin at Fox was like, "This is. I'm not doing this. We don't need it." It doesn't need to be as crazy as and it one is. One of the biggest things I noticed this season, it used to be that you would, your, your target was to try and get your first 13 episodes in the can and then pray to God that you get what's called a back nine, which would be the typical 22 episode season. This is the first time that I've been in LA uh, where I've noticed that the networks have kind of abandoned that, not completely and totally, there's still definitely shows that are doing that. But there are other shows, there was a show that I worked on called Reckless where they shot, I think it was 12 episodes and that's their season. It's a 12-episode season with a beginning, a middle, and an end, very similar to what Breaking Bad has done or most of the cable network shows. So this is one of the first seasons where I've seen uh, shows that are literally coming out with like a 10-episode arc. That is their season. They're not trying to get a back nine. They're not trying to get a full 22-episode season, which also means that that's... And it keeps those those 10 and like really craft. You don't have to write filler episodes anymore. Even great shows like West Wing had to have filler episodes midway through it where they're kind of one-offs, which is basically what's called a a procedural in nature. Um, So that's really interesting to me. But it also means that there's going to be more, there will be more new shows. Um, because now they won't be able to fill that 22 episode yeah. season arc. So there'll be another show coming in in the fall to take the spot of that show that just wrapped up a 10 episode arc. And so it's very interesting. Yeah, and also like last year, it was the first time I was like, I'm, I had, was kind of, I needed a break from pilot season, so I chose to do a film during pilot season last year. And everyone kind of said I was crazy, and I said that's fine. I'm taking this is my, tr- you know, I needed to honor myself and just do that. And then on. Um, the audition for the after came around in in the the fall. Um, I, I think we I auditioned in like August or something for it. And a lot of I bring that up because a lot of the Amazon shows, the Netflix shows, the cable shows, they're having their auditions July, August, September. You know, we shot the pilot yeah, in October, so it's just it, everything is changing in this. And that's what we were talking about earlier. And it's more relaxed because. It, it actually is starting to go all year round, and it's and it's kind of cool because they a lot of shows are shooting all thirteen or all ten or whatever before mm-hmm. any of them air. So they're not you're not uh, on a show on a show like mine. You have what people are saying about it definitely bleeds into the writers room, like how people are receiving certain characters. S- s- can influence like where the characters are taken but on these on these shows now it's like the creative team has decided exactly the arc that's going to happen and it then all airs at once there's something kind of cool and sort of pure about that that i love and i think that that's why people are saying this is the golden age of television right now because you have uh, my friend allison tolman who's on fargo who's brilliant on the show but we were talking about how yeah you damn straight (laughs) Anyway, but Allison was telling me that uh, when they picked Fargo up, they literally picked up all 10 episodes for the season. The writer knew exactly where he wanted to take it from episode one. You have series regulars on the show that they don't have to bring in until episode two or episode three. So it really gives a lot of freedom to the writers at this point. Whereas before they were like, oh, I've got a series regular. We're paying this guy 20000 an episode. We've got We've to gotta use, use him. him. Yeah. And yeah. they have no story for him. And, you know? and um, we are out of time, but... but to touch on the last part of that, I think the other big change uh, and part of what's led um, the studios to, to, to start doing shows that way is social media and Twitter and Facebook and these, you know, the spoiler alerts, that, that's, that's no joke. And um, my show, we're doing all 10 episodes, but it's it, the reason they're doing it that way and they're letting Chris write the entire thing before we ever start shooting is um, out of keeping it secret. And it's so, I mean, we don't have, we have secret names, we have, it's all, and it's not like, 
I mean, yeah, a lot of shows are doing that. It's not just our show. It's like literally uh, protecting the show is such a real thing now with Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all of that. I think that's the wave that we're starting to see um, come up more often too. Uh, and with that, we've got to close. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you for coming. Happy ATX, everybody. See you next year.